Come on, Ian. Come on. <laughs> As the big man Ian Wright said there, special guest settings. I've been delighted to finally get him back on the platform. People, I'm back again. How are you doing, my friend, before we get into everything? Yeah, very good, mate. How about you? Thanks for having me back on. It's always a pleasure, man. I'm good. I'm good. You see what my team's doing or our team better yet? You know, we batted PSG. Before we get into PSG, and I definitely want to touch base with you about the Leicester game and preview the Southampton game. I want to ask you more some general questions about Arsenal or things that are held in us. The first thing I want to ask you is, how do you feel about we're being described as boring? Who said that? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't call them your friends, but that's what you see when you type oh, Arsenal yeah. in. We're boring and yeah. we're not entertaining and we don't move the neutral. Not that I necessarily care about that or that wins titles, but yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. yeah, I don't know if they'll be my friends if I find out if any of them have been saying that. But um, <laughs> I don't think it's boring. I think, listen, the, the PSG game wasn't a classic, let's be honest. The second half in particular was, was a bit dull, but I think... Arsenal did what they needed to do to get a good win against a, um, a a good opponent. And I think we all remember a couple of seasons ago, the first title race, where every game was sort of edgy of seats, sort of nice panicking. Pitch. Yeah, you remember the three threes against Southampton, 2-2 West Ham, 2-2 Liverpool. They were hectic matches and Arsenal didn't win. Last season, they, they sort of found a, a sweet spot in between professionalism and still maintaining that excitement. And um, they came very close. And I think this year they look even more professional. And it's a weird one because I think if Arsenal were too open and exciting and they don't win games, then obviously they get criticised. And now they're too boring, but they're winning games and they're still getting criticised. So the goal I think it's one, exactly. It's, it's you can't you kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't really as Arsenal. You can't really you can't really win. I, I they've not hit top gear this season yet, but it is October. I think if you know if they were playing top top football now. I think a lot of people will be saying, can they sustain this for the rest of the season? I remember last season, Arsenal really? didn't really hit their stride until after the winter break and after Dubai, and they came back in January, and then they were phenomenal pretty much to the end of the season. If Arsenal were able to do something similar this season, I think we'll all be pretty happy. So I'm fine with how Arsenal have started. You have to remember, you know, they've not lost a game. So if they're, if they're boring, then so be it. it. Not it's amazing. The match. Exactly. Uh, that kind of boils, boils in greatly to the next question I want to ask you. I want to ask you about, you You kind of indirectly said it, why don't you think we've hit top gear yet? Just because it's early, I think. I think also the fact that a lot of the best players haven't been available. I mean, listen, the players who've been available have done a great job, but an Arsenal team without Martin Odegaard is a worse team than with... with Amen. Yeah, I'm sorry, I stumbled across my words there. But listen, he's, he's the, the captain, probably the best player at the club, in my opinion, one of the best players in the league, if not the best player in the league. So... Having him out for a month now, it's been, and you know, probably longer. It's, it's it's a big loss, and you have to cope with that. Arsenal have had lots of players out of the back as well. Ben White's had injuries. Calafiori's had injuries. Still not seen Tommy Astor this season. We only just saw Marino. So lots of things haven't quite gone in Arsenal's favour in terms of availability. You have to feel out the new signings. So people like Sterling still being bedded in. Uh, again, I mentioned Marino. Calafiori sort of just about starting to settle in now. So those things take time, and. Um, I think also a big part of it is who they've played. So they played in their True. first five games, Villa away, Spurs away, City away. That's three of the toughest games in the league. So, you know, I think when you consider that and you consider they've come away, I think having lost once, drawn twice, uh, Brighton at home as well is not an easy game. So in all those games, I think it's fair enough that Arsenal haven't hit top, top gear. They played great opponents. They've not had everyone available and it's the start of the season. New signings need to bed in. I think if they're still not quite hitting top gear in, let's say, I don't know, February, March, then we can have these conversations. But as long as they're still getting results, then I think that's fine. You're right, man. It's a results-driven game. And I do think we've had the rub of the green of, on occasions, but then they do say in life, you make your own luck, as probably shown with the Leicester game. I'll definitely say Aston Villa. What, what's been the most enjoyable game for you as an Arsenal fan so far this season, or the one where you thought, you know what, we've been superb? Um, hmm. it's hard to think of a superb one. I thought they were actually really good against Brighton for the first half and really good against Leicester for and well the whole game. I think they I saw somewhere they ended that game with six XG or something, which is just ridiculous. Something crazy, yeah. I really enjoyed the defensive display against Man City actually in the second half. I know lots of people will say um it was boring, but 
I love a sort of back to the wall kind of away day victory. And you know, I know it wasn't a victory in the end, but you know, the way Arsenal yeah, performed, John Stone said their goal was a winning goal, man. It's yeah, yeah, I've gone on about it enough, you wouldn't know it, but yeah, um, <laughs> it wasn't, it was a shame. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed that. Probably the performance I've enjoyed the most, the result I've enjoyed the most was Villa away just because a bit of revenge for last season, but also I thought that's the kind of game that Arsenal would have lost last season in terms of rode their luck a bit, like you said, but they were able to get over the line and they were clinical. And the most frustrating thing with Nelson Van and Nelson journalists when you watch them is they're so on top and they're so dominant and they don't convert that into goals. For some reason away from home, they've been able to do that for the most part this season. At home, it's been a bit of a different case. But yeah, I'd say Villa away was, was a stand up. It's a tough one, you know, because I'm with you with Villa because I actually think we were second best for a lot of the time. And I actually feel for the vast majority of the game, that's probably the worst we've played up until we yeah. scored and we, we looked comfortable. So I, I think that's definitely a shout. Had the Leicester game not have been as crazy as it was in the second half, I probably would have said that because I think we kind of, I can't, as you said, Martin Odegaard's not been there. I can't say we haven't been at our, our free flowing best, but it felt like something close to that. For me, I, I mean, the City one's a shout. I'll probably say the PSG game recently, just because I did not think we'd come out there in the way we played. You know, since Odegaard's not been there, we haven't pressed exactly as high up the field as we used to. And I think we saw that in that game. I think individually, every player stood up to be counted. I loved the build-up play. We'll get on to Timber and Calafuri, but they were amazing. There was just so much to like. Second half, obviously, there was more defending than we'd have liked to do. But not being funny, it's PSG. There was going to be that. And I think kind of tying into what you said about City, we defended well. We weren't being broken down. We already had the lead. So I'd describe it as a professional performance so it would be PSG for me on a circle back to the City game do you think it's a point gained or two points dropped because there was a lot to there was, there was a lot to unpack in that game a lot yeah it's it's really hard to to answer that question I think in the scheme of things if you look at it as a whole one point when you're down to 10 men for 50 odd minutes at the Etihad is fantastic but having come so close literally a kick away from the three it's hard not to look at it as two drops. I think overall you, you want to think positively. And I think the way Arsenal have bounced back ever since then suggests that they've thought pretty positively about it since as well. You know, they've won every single game they've played since that match and they've looked pretty convincing in every game they've played since that match. So I don't think it's slowing them down. I don't think they're feeling bad about it. So I'd say in the grand scheme of things, a point gained. And if they'd lost that game, then I think it would have been a real sort of a dampener and, and maybe a, a sort of a, a speed bump in the, in the title ambition. So... I think a point gained in the scheme of things, you take two points off City, that's always going to be a positive. Obviously, you would prefer to take three off them, but I think it's all right in the grand scheme of things, yeah. Do you think if, if it was 11 versus 11, do you think we win it? It's really hard to say because I think Arsenal would have ended up defending like that for the last 20 minutes or so if it was still 2-1. And I don't think City would have come out and been... Um, I don't think... So in the second half of the first half, Arsenal were well on top. And I thought City were quite poor. I think they would have felt their way into the game and created some chances. I think the most frustrating thing for me about that game was that should have been an all-time Premier League classic. Like the first half yeah. until the red card was, was one of the best games I've ever seen. And especially going into it with such low expectations from last season's game between Arsenal and City, which were, you know, great results for Arsenal, but awful spectacles. Coming into this one, I had really low expectations and then it turned out to be this fantastic game. I thought, wow, I can't wait what's going to happen in the second half. How will City come back? How will Arsenal attack it? Should they and defend? They they attack it? So finely poised. And then obviously the red card just flipped the game on its head. So I can't even remember what your question was. Sorry, I went on a, on a bit of a rant there about uh, <laughs> about the red card. But I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, pretty happy with 2-2 away for City. What would you make of this developing quote unquote rivalry with Arsenal and City? Because the last couple of years we've seen, you know, our coaches getting into it with the players. Obviously, you know, as part of your job, you would have seen what all the City players were saying after the game. We all saw like Harlan just quite frankly, being a baby, throwing his toys out the pram. For me, personally, I like it from both teams. Like, I can't love, pardon my language, shithousery from Benjamin White and Kai Havertz, and then people are doing it to us and I'm crying. And I also love it of the basis of City used to just smash us on a football field, tell us we're so good and pat us on our heads. Now, I can't quite say they're rattled because they've been there, done it and wore the T-shirt, but they, we're genuinely living rent-free in their minds. Like, we're genuinely upsetting them. So, for me, it shows that we're really and truly are competitive again. But where do you stand on that? No, I think you're spot on. I think the fact that in the aftermath of that game, City were were running them out as much as they were shows that they're 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 threatened by Arsenal in the sense that they think, wow, this is a team that can actually do damage to us. We need to beat them. We need to get every advantage over them that we can. And I thought it was massively hypocritical. Listen, Bernardo Silva coming out and saying, 
Uh, <laughs> there was only one team that tried to play football. I remember when it was New Year's Day and um, Arsenal tried to take a quick free kick. They were down to 10 men in that second half against Man City. Bernardo Silva died for a penalty um, and then started kicking the ball away when Arsenal trying to take a quick free kick. So, you know, it's, it's something that everyone does. And I think to pretend you're the one team that doesn't do it is, is ridiculous. But I'm here for the rivalry. I think it's great. I think the the so as just as, as a football fan, the Liverpool City rivalry was great because it was two completely different stylistic teams and it was really entertaining matches a lot of the time and it was fun to watch. But the one thing missing from it was a bit of needle because the two managers were very respectful of each other. The two sets of players were pretty respectful of each other. I think it's much more fun when the two teams properly hate each other. You know, you think back to Arsenal United back in the day, yeah. Arsenal Chelsea when unfortunately Chelsea finished on top in the Mourinho era. Those were fun rivalries and, and they, they mattered and you care more and you remember them. I don't know if people will remember the City Liverpool rivalry in the same way they remember the Arsenal United rivalry. Like people talk about it nearly 25 years on. People still talk about Keenan Vieira all the time. And I'd love for a, a similar thing to happen this summer around and a, a Haaland versus Havertz kind of thing. You know, that would be amazing. And yeah, from a journalistic perspective, being selfish, it gives me a lot to write about and I enjoy that side exactly. of things. But it's much more entertaining. I think everyone should really enjoy it. And Listen, I think Arsenal fans didn't like City anyway, but the fact that the players are now brought into it, then yeah, all here for it. And I think that rivalry needed a bit of needle because you need a bit of emotion behind it to really take you that extra, you know, one inch. And it makes all the difference in those big games. And last season, I think Arsenal didn't quite have it. They thought, oh, wow, these guys yeah. are great and we respect them. Now it's like, we respect you because we know you're a good team, but we don't respect you in the sense we don't think you're better than us. And I think yeah, humans makes- just like us. Yeah, exactly. I think you're bang on the money. Do you think Arsenal are judged? Comp- I know us Arsenal fans, We I do think we do the woe is me thing. I do think we're a bit like conspiracy theorists. But at the same time, for me, it does feel like there's one rule for everybody else and one for my football club. Now, rules are rules. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. But I'm sure you've seen it with the use of second, you know, two yellow cards being issued for certain players than others. Do you think we're judged very differently or refereed very differently to other clubs? Um. I, I I don't think so. No, I think I think there are um, every every team will have a, a, a BS refereeing decision that's gone against them, and I'm sure Arsenal can point to won't remember plenty that have gone in their favour, but there'll be plenty across the course of the season that will go in Arsenal's favour, and that's just the way it goes sometimes. And Arsenal have had two very high profile ones, and it's cost them four points. My biggest issue with the refereeing is is do we actually want games being decided on the basis of someone kicking the ball away. Like in Declan Rice's case, Trossard I have less of an issue with because it was a stupid thing to do. And I think he kind of knew what he's doing. He sort of tries to pull out a bit, but I agree. Again, like, um, the idea that Rice was then suspended for the North London derby for knocking the ball away just a yard. Like I wrote at the time that he was yeah, stupid. Well, to do it. Moving as well. yeah, exactly. I still think he was kind of stupid to do it, but I think, do we actually want games being decided by that? Like, was anyone really talking about it last season? Was anyone saying, oh, the biggest issue in the game is this, delaying restarts it's like no I think everyone sort of understands that like yeah it's annoying when it happens but it does happen you kind of just have to get on with it and I'd love for the referees to be able to use a bit of common sense in those situations and just say look if you do that again I'm going to book you but yeah, it's not wrong, yeah. don't do that again otherwise I'm going to book you and then and then you can't have any complaints but the idea that you're going to completely transform a game because someone's done something as, as minute as that especially like the rice one was so small Trossard was right on the stroke of half time like it wasn't going to make any difference in the grand scheme of things. And I don't like the idea that referees are so trigger happy and so willing and so keen to send players off. That's not their job. Their job isn't to necessarily be an enforcer of the rules. It's to be an officiator of the rules. And I think there is a difference. I think a lot of the the art of refereeing is that uh, maybe a yellow card in a North London derby would be a red card in another game. And maybe people find that lack of consistency. Judging the climate properly. properly. Exactly. But the reality is there is there's different different fouls in different games mean different things. And I think as a football watching public, we probably have a bit of growing up to do in terms of accepting that's a thing and not being like we need consistency, consistency, consistency. And uh, I think VAR is a big part of that as well. But uh, yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on refereeing. I don't think it's I don't think it's good at the minute. And I think nah, let us know your thoughts on refereeing. Man. We can stay on panda. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're here, man. I want to hear all your thoughts. It can't be any worse than mine, bro. It can't. Be. <laughs> <laughs> and even that with referees, like I, I'm sure that one thing that annoys me about how referees are looked at is because I, I obviously, if you make an article that's completely false, for example, you're going to get criticised. If I make a video that's false, people are going to comment. If a player or a manager or whoever in football, if they have good or bad. Um, 
like performances, they're going to be judged appropriately. For me, it doesn't feel the case with referees. I don't feel managers can be exactly honest in their conferences about refereeing because they know they're going to get fines. I think refs are very protected. I think people move like referees are robots. They, they watch football just like me and you. They're subject to bias and unconscious bias. Like They might think Arsenal are a bunch of cheaters, so naturally they're going to judge us appropriately, which I think is a, a, a bit of an issue. Do you think referees in today's day and age are making the game a bit too much about them unnecessarily? I think in the Premier League it's happening. It's interesting. So we, we watch the Champions League, right? And the Atalanta game, the PSG game. Do you remember a single refereeing decision in any of those games? I was praising the ref for the PSG yeah. game, to be fair with you. I thought he did a good job too. And I, I watched the um, Villa Bayern Munich game last night and I thought he let a lot go and I thought it made for a much better game. And I think the European referees seem to have it in a way that they can sort of exercise common sense and sort of understand the sense of occasion and understand that it's a it's a big deal and maybe you just your, your job isn't to be there to send players off it's to it's to exactly try and make sure that everyone's safe basically and try and make sure that everyone plays within the rules as much as possible and i think yeah english referees it does seem to be in particular listen, i don't watch any other league as much as i watch the premier league so it's hard for me to judge fully but it does seem that there there's a almost an onus on them to be so much more trigger happy and so much more uh, like you said, making themselves a centre of attention. And it seems in the Premier League, we've got this like obsession every week with, we're talking about, like if you watch Match of the Day, every week it's a referee incision, a referee incision. I don't know about you, but I find it really, really boring. Like I'd rather it's be mundane, talking about football. And in the Champions League, Europa League even, Conference League even, doesn't seem to be a thing. So I'd love to know. I mean, I'd need to look deeper into what's going on there because without trying to make judgments just sort of off the cuff, but it does seem to be the case that when the English referees are involved, it seems to go a lot more smoothly. Exactly, man. And I'm 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 a, a son of the Arsene Wenger school of thought, so I'll always have it for referees, just like our former manager had, which is crazy. Um, what do you make of how we're judged for dark arts? Because when we didn't, and we was quote unquote naive, people said we needed to be a bit street smart. Now we're being street smart. People have an issue. I think under Mikel Arteta at Arsenal, I think one thing that for me shows his evolution as an Arsenal manager. We'll see the way he's complained about certain decisions after games. Like for, there was a while he would complain and complain, nothing happened. So he said, I'm going to sort this out myself. I think people are just mad that we're playing the game better than them or playing the game the best at the moment. But where are you at with that? No, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's interesting to notice how Arteta's changed when it comes to refereeing decisions. He's, I think, a lot less emotional in his analysis and a lot more clinical. So if maybe you think back to Newcastle last season where it was pure oh, emotion, man. his reaction, he was, he was, he was clearly fuming. Was a couple of years ago as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And he, in those instances, I don't think he was necessarily thinking with clarity. Whereas it seems now when he talked about the Declan Rice yellow card, I thought he was spot on that, you know, if you're going to, and he said it after Trossard's as well, that if you're going to give yellow cards for that, that's fine, but there's going to be a hundred red cards throughout the Premier League just for that this season. And there won't, be, no be, there there won't be, and that's, you know, that's a nonsense. But I think Arsenal in the dark arts is, is interesting. I wonder if, um, I wonder how much City have made a narrative there in a sense by coming out and being so proactive with it. And I think that they'll, they'll, they'll hammer that home for the rest of the season. I don't think Arsenal were necessarily worse or better than anyone else. I don't think people spoke about it in the Spurs game. I didn't think anything else was anything dirty in that game. Like I remember in the Vicario Timber fight, it's Vicario who starts it and Timber just exactly. So, there's so many things like that, and you're right that we all remember back in the Wenger sort of late noughties days where Arsenal were a really young team and they were they were told off for being too naive and not streetwise enough. And the idea was that they had this soft underbelly and they play lovely football, but the second you made it tough for them. They, they'd wilt under the pressure. And, and this Arsenal team isn't like that. They can play the lovely football, but if you want to go to war with them, they'll happily battle you. And exactly. I think that's a good change. It's a positive change. And people aren't going to like it because, you know, no one likes to see their team getting kicked or have, you know, like you said, shit has really going against them. But um, yeah, it's just one of those things. I don't think Arsenal are any worse or better. I just think it's something they do when they need to. And I think it's a good thing they can do it. And I, I don't want to do it all the time, but if they need to, then go for it. Every team does it. I think you're bang on the money. What have you made of Arsenal from like probably what August up until this point now? We've had injuries, as you said earlier, we've had some tough games. And we've not everything's been perfect. Obviously, we have dropped points, but we've come through it well and our charge for the title is still intact. Does it make you, you know, give a bit more plaudits to not only Mikel Arteta, but the players for coping with such? Definitely. I looked at that fixture list at the start of the season and I thought. Wow, in those first five games, 
Wolves at home is kind of the only one where you think, oh, yeah, it's a guaranteed three points. The other yeah. four, it's tough. And and when Brighton came to the Emirates, people forget they were, I think they were top of the league at the time, or they were on a really good run of form. They're just manager very good. Yeah, man, you aren't the team they used to be, but they still beat them. And um, yeah, it's um, it's really, really positive. I think Arsenal results wise, listen, and, and as we were saying before, they've not hit top gear, but they've sustained a title race that, you know, if they'd lost to Villa, Spurs and City away, which is very, very plausible. Any season that can happen, any Arsenal team that can happen. If they lost all three of those games, we'd be talking about are Arsenal still even in a title race? And now it's like, are they where they want to be in the title race and are they leading a title race? And I think the unexpected sort of spanner in the works potentially has been Liverpool because they've been really good and I don't think anyone expects them to be as good as they have been. But from an Arsenal perspective, they've done everything they can do. They've, they've stuck to their job and yeah, maybe the Brighton game is one where they think, oh, we probably should have won that as opposed to draw it. But beyond that, I think they'd be pretty happy with all the results they've got this season. And in terms of the title race, they're in a really strong position. And I'm not saying from here on out, it's going to be easy, but they've got, like I said, three of the four toughest fixtures out of the way. Like Anfield is probably the toughest away ground they've got left. And then beyond that, you start thinking, well, you're counting the points that Arsenal should be picking up and the levels of consistency that they've been able to show. Like we forget in 2024, they've lost twice. And one of those came against Liverpool, I think, on January the 6th. So if you sort of go from that onwards, Dubai, post Dubai Arsenal, have lost twice, uh, once, sorry, in competitive um, games in the league. And that, that's unbelievable. So I think it's looking really positive for Arsenal. In the Champions League, they've done really well as well. It's quite a top-heavy draw in the sense that they're difficult games are at the start. So Atalanta away, PSG at home, and I think Inter away is their next one, if I'm not mistaken. San Siro, yeah, I think you're yeah. right. San Siro, not an easy yeah, feat, man. Right. I can't remember. Do that. I can't remember. Yeah, it's going to be good, that game. I'm looking forward to that. But they've got all the difficult games, basically, at the start, and it's been the same in the Premier League, and they've started really strong. And after a Euro summer, lots of teams don't start strongly, and, and Arsenal have managed it. So, yeah, positive, positive. I think Arsenal are in a really good place right now. Do you believe this is our year? <laughs> you're trying to put me on the spot like Saka. <laughs> exactly, uh, man. Exactly that. <laughs> I, I, it's hard not to think so when they're still winning games without Erdegaard and City have got Rodri out for the rest of the season. You look at those two things and you think, wow, this is this is looking pretty good. And you yeah, look at the jet I, I know. You don't want to get too excited, but it's hard to see where the the, the slip up is going to come. Having said that, I've jinxed it now. It's definitely going to come, but it looks positive. I'll, I'll go that far. I won't go as full as full on as Saka was the other night, but it looks very, very good. <laughs> And that's the thing, man. I think, do you know what it is? I think with me, I think, you know, on our day, we're amazing. Like I always say, at the em in the Premier League, I am a bit more wary of us at the Emirates just because it seems like them games are kind of more, like, appealing for the neutrals. Away from home, we just take care of business. And I'd flip that around in the champs. But then I look at it and I'd say, the only thing that can beat us is ourselves because it's always the games that should be walkovers, that there's banana skins. Like the Leicester game, it was amazing. It was free-flowing. We scored two goals. Probably should have scored four in the first half. Then, obviously, you saw, you know, it's like what Arteta seems to keep saying. You have to kill the game before it kills you. It almost killed us. And then, you know, to be in the 90th minute and it's 2-2, two -two, we found four goals. It speaks volumes of, like you were saying earlier, our resilience, you know, our character, et cetera, et cetera. But it's these kind of games that scare me. And it's even like Southampton. They couldn't buy They can't buy a win. Ramsdale can't keep the mark out of his back of his net. We know it's a very different Southampton that awaits us on Saturday. Like, we both know Ramsdale's going to turn into Cassius at some point. So, <laughs> for me, it's the little games, man, that kind of are like that. You said it there, man, with Odegaard's injury. Now, I have to ask you it. Like, are we better without Odegaard? No. Uh, <laughs> they found a way to cope without him. Trossard and Havertz doing that little sort of swapping the false nine position. It looks, it, it works so well. And they're both such intelligent players that they can do it. But no team is better without Martin Odegaard. I think he's the best midfielder in the world. He's the best creative presence in the world. He's so good off the ball as well. Like you were saying earlier in terms of the press, when he's back, Arsenal will be a much better team. And uh, hopefully that's that's not too far down the line. What have you made of Martinelli recently? Because he seems to have obviously not against PSG. He was very unlucky with that volley. But in terms of goals and assists, he's been quote unquote productive the last few weeks. Do you think he's turned the corner? I hope so. I thought he was really good at the Etihad. I thought he stepped up at the Etihad when Arsenal needed him. He showed real quality on the break because I can think of countless number of times where he gets the ball on the counter, he dribbles down the left wing and then just sort of looks down, doesn't look up, puts in kind of an aimless cross on his left foot and it doesn't really work out. Yeah. Against City, he had the quality. He obviously got the assist for Calafiori, but he put in a few decent crosses before that. And I thought he looked really good at times against Leicester in the first half. I thought we sort of, oh, OK, we're just getting back to the best Martinelli and 
I'd love for him to go on a run of two, three games now scoring each time because he is, for me, a real confidence player. And, and when he's not thinking, that's right. when he's at his best. The second he sort of has to think and and, and sort of panic and it's slow like down. Up. Exactly. That's when he seems to struggle. And I think he, and Mikhail said this years ago, he sort of he plays the game at 100 miles an hour and he needs to add gears to it. And he's added those gears to it now. But there are times when he gets into the final third where maybe he just doesn't quite have that composure. And I think that'll be a confidence thing that when he's scoring more in front of goal, the composure will come back. So I hope he's turned the corner because um, last season was a bit disappointing by his very high standards. And I'd love for him to be back. And listen, if he ends the season with 10, 15 goals, Arsenal are looking really good up front because Havertz is already on course. Jesus is, I, know, I think, will probably hit double figures. Trossard's close. Saka will get there. So... If he ends up with 10 15, then also got a real, real firepower up front. Would love him to do that, man. What have you made of Thomas Partey's for? Especially because it's his last year. Do you think he could earn a new contract? I think at his age, I'd be surprised. I have to be honest, just because uh, he's the wrong side of 30 now. And I think if Arsenal were going to start talking to him about contract extensions, they probably would have thought about it already. I know Mikel Arteta rates him very highly. And when, you know, I think there were people at the club who were happy to let him go over the past few summers, Arteta's put his foot down and said, nope, he's staying. He's part of my plans. And that's been a big part of things. And I think he's not always been top draw this season. He's had a few moments where you think, Blumenek Partey, what are you doing? Like he gives them all away sometimes in stupid positions. You're like, what are you doing? But when off Arteta a really bit needed bit him at the Etihad, Wow, what a display that was. He was unreal. He was really good, I thought, in the first half against PSG. I thought he was good in the first half against Leicester. I think with Partey's thing is now that, you know, playing every three days, that's the question is, can he do that at the top, top level? Can he play every three days? Um, obviously, Jorginho is a fantastic backup if you need to swap them in and, and Rice can drop into the six. And it'll be interesting now Marino's fit. You know, will Partey be the one to drop out to make him, uh, to accommodate him, sorry? That'll be fascinating to see. And... I think Partey has, has done himself, you know, no harm with how he's played this season. I think he's, he's been pretty good. I think he definitely probably thinks he can be better in terms of his levels because I've, I've seen him play so much better for Arsenal, but I've also True. seen him play much worse. And I think he's been good for the most part. So, yeah, good good season from Partey. But it'd be fascinating to see how things work now Marino's here. It kind of, and that ties into what I was going to ask you because for you, who drops out? Because on paper, I do think the plan was Declan Rice, Odegaard, and obviously Mikel Moreno. Partey's form... I don't know if he should be dropped. Now, I am not advocating to drop Declan Rice. I don't feel comfortable without Declan Rice not being in that team. It's like, if our team was a car, he's the seatbelt. I feel a lot more comfortable with him there. But who would be dropped out? Like, for instance, if he was going to start against Southampton on the weekend? It is a difficult question, isn't it? Um, I agree. You can't leave Declan Rice out the side. So it's probably got to be Thomas Partey from the team he played against PSG. I don't know if he will start straight away. I think Arsenal will probably gear him back up because he had one training session before he played on Tuesday. Like that's He needs a bit of time to build up his match fitness. And I thought as good as he was on Tuesday, he did show signs of rustiness every now and again. Like His touch was a yeah. little bit off and maybe he'll need a bit of time to build that up. And I think over the international break, he'll have two weeks working at London Colony with, with Mikel and that'll be really good for him, just like it was for, for Sterling when he had it in the last international break. So... I'm excited to see what happens with Marino. I think it's uh, a signing that lots of people are very excited about. I don't necessarily know if he's coming in to be a, a first nailed on first team player. I wonder if maybe the the midfield will stay the same when Erdegaard's fit and it'll be Erdegaard, Rice, Partey, and Marino will be sort of the first man off the bench and he can do that creative role that Erdegaard does, but he can also do the defensive role that Rice does or Partey does. So, yeah, he gives Arsenal options in midfield and that's what Mikel wants. Yeah. I think the major thing with me with Mikel with Marino would be you're going to go over to the left now. I feel Calafuri and Martinelli got a great developing partnership. You add him over there, we're we're gone back to the days where we've we've gone back to the days where we we look a threat down the left and the right. I feel in the last couple of years we've probably been a lot a lot lot sided. If I'm honest, I want to ask you about Declan Rice. Now I like him in the eight. I think he's given a good go at it. I think he's doing his thing. I feel people get hung up on technicalities. Just because you're at eight, don't mean you have to not do six things. But I must admit, I am gearing towards. Just put Declan Rice back into six, man. That's his bread and butter. That's where he thrives. Just kind of make him our Rodri. Where are you at with that? Hmm. It's a difficult one, man. It is. I, uh, the Rodri comparison is tough because I think Rodri is technically and physically the best midfielder in the world. I know I don't like saying about a City player, especially a City player who said something. Be honest, though, he is, he is. He's a fantastic player. He's an annoyingly good player. 
Um, I don't know if Rice is a similar kind of player, similar kind of profile. I don't know if he'll ever be as good a passer as Rodri is. Probably not. Rodri is, you know, a brilliant passer. I think Rice is really good, don't get me wrong. But in terms of things like receiving the ball with his back to play, I don't know if Rodri will be, as Rice or sorry, will be on that level. But I don't think that necessarily means he can't play in the six. And I think that's where Arteta sees him in the long term. It's where he sees himself in the long term. And the one thing he's shown throughout his career is that he can learn and develop really quickly. And he started at West Ham as a, a centre back in a back three, and now he's one of the now best left eights in the world. Like, and we saw saw against Bolton. You know, you know, he can he can go forward, and he's got a bit of quality in the final third. Like, if you give him a chance, he'll he'll punish you. And I'd love to see more goals from Rice this season. I like him in that left eight role. Um, I, I like having the sort of security of someone behind him who is possessionally very strong. I liked it when they had, you know, a couple of seasons ago and it was Granit Xhaka in that left eight role and Partey behind him and Erdegaard there. And I like the balance of that in terms of one guy can do both the attack and defence, one guy is primarily defence and one guy is primarily attack. And I think Rice in the eight gives you that. So I'm a fan of that personally. I'm a bit more, um, I'm, in terms of my approach to football, I'm just more of a lock the back door first before you try and go out. That's just how I, I view things. I build from the back. Maybe maybe Arteta probably shares that. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. I think so in, in, in certain circumstances. But uh, yeah, I, I like Rice in the eight personally. And I think it's interesting. Obviously, Arsenal were going for Martin Zubamendi. I know Liverpool were interested, but Arsenal are still very interested in him. And you think if he comes in, where's he going to play? He, to me, is more similar to Rodri. And it's not just because they're both Spanish. It's because yeah. stylistically, I think he's a lot more similar. And I think a midfield of, listen, you mentioned Partey is probably going to lead this summer, Jorginho too. So Arsenal will need to sign a six regardless. And a midfielder Zid Mendy, Rice and Erdegaard. Now we're talking. Like that's 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 proper. So Mouthwater yeah. stuff, man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Do you think we'd obviously like, you know, you're not at our, our, on in Arsenal's recruitment staff and things like that, but you mentioned we're still interested in Zub Mendy. I don't doubt that, but you know, we'll never know exactly what happened. But it feels like he took us around the houses. Now, when I look at Vlahovic and Locatelli, it's like when you bur burn Arsenal once, it's like we'd leave you alone. Do you think, like, if there was a deal to be done, considering that we would go back in for Martin Zubimendi? Uh Yeah, definitely. I don't. I don't think it's the case that maybe Arsenal will will cut ties or tie. I think, like, for example, like look at Jorginho. Um, you know, they tried That's signing him and then they went back in and got him. Um, similar with Neto, actually. They tried signing him a couple of summers before, went in and got him. Even with making our Arteta our manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. So, I think if Div Mendy's available this summer and willing to leave Real Sociedad, Arsenal will try and get themselves the front of the queue. And the question will just be in terms of what package you can offer because every team in the world wants him. Like, he is yeah. such a highly sought-after player. I think... Arsenal may have an edge in the sense that um, they'll be able to convince him by saying, look, come be the future of our midfield. Jorginho and Partey have gone. You're all our the Spanish you've got. Exactly. So I think that could be that could be big. And obviously the, the Basque country link. But That's I think well. Zoom Mendy, he seems genuine when he says, I want to stay at Sociedad and be a, a real club legend. He seems to really you know, want to be a success there. I do wonder if eventually the time will come where he thinks that I need to be playing regular Champions League football. I need to be playing at the top of the top of my game and the top of top of world I football. Thought it was going to, be to be fair, I yeah, genuinely I, I thought that too, and I was worried because I thought, oh God, if he goes there, then also I've got no chance of signing him. But um, it's worked out well from our perspective. He didn't go to Liverpool, and I'd love to see him at the Emirates next season. Yeah. What have you made of our two new new fullback signings? I say new because you know Timbers finally started playing. Personally, I think he's done very well coming yeah. off off a year of an ACL with the amount of games we've played. He's been amazing, whether it's left back, right back. Calafuri for me has been a revelation. Like against PSG, you're seeing him pick up forward positions that Martin Odegaard would be in. The man's <laughs> amazing. Like, what have you made of them two? And like, do you feel they are first choice fullbacks? Ooh. Oh, that's a very good question. I, I, I'll, I'll say so. I'll, I'll talk about how they've been first, and then I'll get to that because I'll, I'll try and oh, think. Yeah, uh, Timber is such a good player. Like, I remember I saw him in the states last summer when he first signed. I remember thinking, "Bloody hell, this guy's good!" Like he's so aggressive in the tackle. He's so defensively switched on, and like I can't think of a chance that Arsenal have conceded that's come down his side. And like, when he's playing at left back, that's a good point. When he's on the right, he locks it down. Like I can't think of a single chance that's come as a result of a timber error or that's from someone beating timber. Like I think he's been fantastic and he's great on the ball as well. Like he reeks of Ajax and everything that he does is just so so Back. technically secure. He can pass it anywhere. He can receive the ball anywhere. 
left foot, right foot, he doesn't care. And yeah, I think he is the perfect modern defender. I think he can play anywhere across that back line. I think we'll really see him. I think he is the first choice wherever he plays along the back four. Like, I don't care where you put him. Timber has to be in that back four. He has to be in the team. If it's left back, that's fine. For me, Ben White is 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 still just about first choice over Ricardo Calafiori, even though obviously they play on different sides. And I'd like what I've seen from Calafiori too. It's funny, he's a he's a big bloke, but he can do the technical side. And you, you mentioned there, like popping up in the 10 position, you see a, a centre back, a, a, sorry, a full back of that stature, and you think, okay, so he'll be good at defending, maybe going forward, not so much. But, but he's he can got go great forward. mobility and agility, man. Yeah, he can do it. He can do it. He's he's a he's a very valuable asset in the final third. He's sort of a, a bull in a china shop. Like he does everything hundred miles an hour. That's, that's a great analogy. Yeah, and I like that about him. I think when he's defending, that that sort of giving everything hundred percent sometimes is is a bit of a problem in the sense that he does seem to overcommit. He's, I think he's got a yellow card in nearly every game he's played for Arsenal so yeah, far. Yeah, he's been out to serve a suspension yeah, at some point. Yeah, that's going to catch up with him. I do worry that maybe there'll be a penalty along the line that he gives away. But fingers crossed, you know, knock on wood. But I think he's a, he's, a, he's a really good player. He's a really good addition. And he fits that back line in terms of, you know, the type of defender Arteta wants. Versatile, technically gifted, big, good in the air threat from set pieces, not going to really get beaten in duels. Very a lot of shirts as well. He's a good looking fella, man. <laughs> all, all of that, all of that. And um, yeah, oh, you, you sidetracked me thinking about how good looking he is now. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a very good player. And um, I think Arsenal are very happy to have him. Are you concerned about Tommy Asu then? Because obviously when they're all fit, we've got great options, great defensive depth. As you and I and everybody listening knows, you need it's different horses for different courses, essentially. But as much as we love Tommy Asu, availability is something that he's kind of allergic to. I just feel Arsenal might potentially move him on next summer because of that. I hope not because I like the guy. But what's your viewpoints on it? Yeah, I really like Tommy Asu too. You talk about 1v1 defenders with Califuri. I don't think there's a better exactly. 1v1 defender at the club than Takahiro Tommy Asu. I think if you ask him to man mark any winger in the world, he'd be able to to stop them. You think back to that Liverpool game a couple of seasons ago when he was put over on the left for the first time, and pardon me, he was up against Salah, Salah, Salah. Salah didn't have a sniff. And I think he's such a good asset when he's fit. He's just not fit enough. And I think that told when Arsenal gave him this contract extension. It was only to twenty twenty six, I think it was when they extension the earlier essential. in the year. It was it was not a big one, was it? So I think that's a sign of. Arsenal thinking, well, we need to protect ourselves here because we don't necessarily trust his availability. And it's maybe a sign that if someone comes in and gives you an offer for him, I don't think Arsenal would turn it down. If you, I remember last summer there was talk of Bayern Munich being interested and it'd be interesting now because like when he's back, like it's tough to even get on the bench at Arsenal right now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought Kimmy really looked really good when he came on the other day and I thought he looked good against Bolton too. And Timber is, you know, Ben White will be fit soon. He'll be back on the bench. And you look at the four who started the other night, they'll all want to be involved. So Arsenal have such strength in depth defensively. And if there's someone who is to go, it does look like Tommy Asu is closest to being out the door. It's, it's a shame because um, I really like him. I still remember when he first came in, he started right back and he took over from Cedric. And Arsenal have been in the trenches for a while <laughs> with, with their right back options. And Tommy Asu came in and he just thought, wow, this guy gets it. He's a proper He's the guy, yeah. Does it all the smile on his face? Yeah. And listen, I'd love for him to stay at Arsenal because I think he's, wherever you put him in the back line, he's going to send back, left, back, right, back. A bit like what we're talking about with Timber. He can be a really, really solid option. I just don't think he's available enough like you were talking about there. And yeah, so I think if an offer came in, Arsenal would certainly consider it. So what do you think the future looks like for Zinchenko? Because he's, he's probably the most polarising of fullbacks we have. Yeah, I don't get why people really hate on him as much as they do because you can either hate him for what he's not or you can love him for what he is and he's never going to exactly. be a defensive master. Like, that's just not him. But if you play him at left back, he gives you so much. Like, he gives you so much in terms of... He can he can control a game from left back. I can't think of many players who can do the same. The debut he season, amazing. Team. It was unbelievable, wasn't it? And he revolutionised what we all thought the, the fullback position could be. Like, we'd all heard of inverted fullbacks and sort of seen it a bit, but... When he came in, you're like, wow, this is this is this is proper. And he's exactly he's he's a good footballer, man. Like I think I think I really like Zinchenko. And I think there are games where I play him, like Leicester, if he'd been fit, I probably would have played him against Leicester at home. But I'm certainly not starting him at the Etihad. 
like there are games where there are Zinchenko games and there are not Zinchenko games. Exactly. Uh, in the squad, as, as you know, with that in mind. And if someone comes in and offers money for Alexander Zinchenko, I think you'd be mad not to consider it just because he is, what, 27 now and he's approaching the final two years of his contract. And I don't think Arsenal have started talks over negotiations, as far as I'm aware. So that would suggest that Arsenal may be open to selling him if an offer comes in. But I don't quite get the hate on him. I really think, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a really good footballer when you ask him to do what he's good at. If you expose him and ask him to do things he's not so good at, then yeah, like any footballer, he struggles. But I think he's, you got to, like I said, love him for what he is. Do you think this is a make or break season for Gabriel Jesus? Oh, you're throwing all these, you're throwing some dynamite questions at me, mate. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it's a big season for, for Gabby J. I think, I remember that James McNicholas report that Arsenal would be open to a, an offer on him. And as far as I'm aware, that's not changed. And that's because his injury issues are a big thing. It's a real shame because we all remember that first half season before he went off to the World Cup uh, when he yes, arrived. It was, amazing, man. it was brilliant. It was, you know, I think he was he was one of the best centre forwards I've seen play for Arsenal in a really, really long time. And we'd love for him to get back to those levels on a regular basis. But if he's not playing, he can't do it. And Kai Havertz, in my opinion, is, is one of the best players at Arsenal right now. And he's doing so well in that centre forward position. Nowhere near his spot. No, no. And listen, if, if Havertz is fit, he's probably up there with David Rara on the first name on the team sheet. And I think that's a that's a sign of, of how far off Jesus is right now. I think he needs a goal. I think he, he, he desperately wanted one against Bolton. I could tell with the way he was playing. And having said all that, I think if you want a player to come in for a big game and, and fill in or play a different position, then he's fantastic. I think right he's now he's basically back at the, the role he was at City where he's sort of next man off the bench. Whatever you need in the forward line, he's the next man off the bench. And um, he doesn't want to do that because he left City because he precisely didn't want to do that. But as long as he's at Arsenal, then I think Arsenal can take advantage of it and uh, reap the rewards because he's a really good footballer. But um, it shows how strong Arsenal are in terms of strength and depth that he's not at the level of the forward line right now. I think you're bang on the money. My second to last question for you. Obviously, we've got Southampton on the weekend. Do you make changes? Because, you know, I personally would like to see the strongest team in Arteta's mind go out. I'd love to. I, I kind of want the best of both of us. I'd love the same team that played against PSG to go out there because I just want my three points. But I would love Ethan to get a start. I wouldn't mind Mikel Moreno getting a start and getting some minutes in the tank. You could make a case of could Raheem Sterling or Gabriel Jesus come in and get some minutes there. But where are you at with that? Um... So obviously Timber's injury situation is a big part of whether you name the, the same lineup. And if if he is injured and Ben White isn't back, what Arsenal do at right back would be interesting because they haven't Lewis got Skelly. Right <laughs> yeah. Maybe Lewis Skelly, maybe put Partey at right back. You know, I'm not a fan of that myself. Oh, let's not go back to them days, man. But if it's the fourth choice option, then that's what you might have to do. And You're right. if you do that, then you play Jorginho and then the whole midfield changes and or maybe you play Marino and so, yeah, a lot hinges on whether Timber's fit or not. And um, I don't think Arsenal will risk him if he's not fully fit because of that ACL. If he, if he goes and pulls a hamstring and you lose him for a month, then I don't think Arsenal will want to risk that. It's so, not worth it, man. No, not at all. Um, whether this is a game for Ethan, I'm not quite sure. I think if, if he was going to play in this game, he probably would have played the Leicester game before. And who are you taking out the side mm -hmm. for? Ethan? Like, you're not dropping Trossard or Havertz right now. So who are you realistically dropping in order to fit him in? That's true. I think that's a that's a, a, a difficult one. I think Ethan's next next games will come. You know, hopefully Arsenal were three, four nil up early doors and then he can come on and play the last half hour. That would be great. An ideal scenario. And I think that's where Arsenal were headed towards against Leicester. But again, I don't think Ethan's quite the um the sort of last resort option. I think he's viewed as a proper first like when Arsenal needed a goal against Leicester, it was Winery who came on. And I think that's the that's the where he is in the courage in that game. Yeah, he looked great. And I think his next start will probably be Preston. I wouldn't start him this weekend. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd name the same team if possible. If everyone's fit, I would. And then, then if, you know, Timmer turns out not to be fit and, and White and Tommy Asu aren't available, then maybe you're looking at part at right back because I don't know about Calafuri at right back. <laughs> I, I, I didn't love it, I have to say. Neither did I. We just had to get through it in that game. Exactly. Something about three left footers in a back four just seems wrong to me. I don't know what it is. Like three right footers, you don't think, four right footers, you don't think about it, but Something, something about a three right. doesn't doesn't <laughs> sit right for me. And um, yeah, it just doesn't work. So I would, yeah. Listen, Southampton, as, as much as they're not the best, they have shown signs that they can they can do stuff. But they were good against United until United went in front. And Arsenal need to be wary of that. And they'll learn their lessons from Leicester. They can't get too far ahead of themselves. 
So I think Mikel will probably go for a strong team, especially with the international break coming up. He'll rinse everyone to the max and then send them off nice and tired to the international break, I think. I think you're bang on the money, man. And that's a good point about the international break. There isn't necessarily a need to rest players. I still think we just need to get the three points. I mean, Southampton are fighting for their lives. It's almost like we're privileged kids, really, in that we're talking about winning the league. Safety is not an option for Arsenal. We're going to be in the division. When your backs are against the wall in life, there's issues. And I think every Arsenal fan, regardless of where Southampton is, naturally, they're one of our bulky teams. Like I, like I said earlier, you'd imagine Ramsdale's going to want to point to creep and play amazing. I actually think Russell Martin's a good coach. I think it's a results-driven game, as you know, results are all that matters. But it's not like they've just got promoted and they're playing poorly they're playing out from the back they're very progressive they just haven't either got the rubber the green defect probably not defended well enough and ultimately not taking their chances and probably don't have enough quality so i'm with you in an ideal world it provided timbers fit strongest team out there put the game to bed hopefully there's four or five goals ethan Mikel moreno anyone who needs sterling anyone who needs minutes you go out there and play my last question for you i got a lot of banter on my channel because i went as you know i went to that press conference with Mikel Arteta, <laughs> and i was struck by his aura <laughs> Am I making this up or is, has he actually got aura? Because people think I'm being weird. Like, I genuinely think he's got aura. Like, I understand now what Declan Rice and all of these recent signings were talking about when they said they hear how Arteta speaks and they're kind of galvanised by it. But I just want to know your thoughts so I don't look crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in answer to your question. See? He's, he's a bit of an intimidating guy in the sense that um, he's very clear in what he thinks about most things. Um, and I think that allows him to to make decisions quickly. And um, you have to sort of, as from a journalistic perspective, you know he's not going to answer questions if you phrase them in a certain way. So it kind of forces you to be on top of your game a bit and, and come up with ways of asking questions that you have to, you know, we'll get an answer. And as journalists, we get a lot of criticism. So why didn't you ask this question this way? It's like, well, Arteta's not going to answer it if you ask it in that way. And listen, you saw in that in that press conference, I remember I was sat next to you and it was like, okay, this is, this is what it's like every week for us, every three days for us, every two yeah. days. Cap free oh, match. Wow. Yeah, he's. I think he's actually. I think he's better with the press now than he was. Oh, um, 100%. He it in the sense that I think he understands that he can send a message out and he can control the narrative, whereas in the past the narrative has controlled him. So I think that's a big difference. And um, he's good in press conferences these days. You know, there are certain things he'll never give anything away, like injury news. Just it's not going to happen. Yeah, Try for five years, it's not going to happen. Like, it's just not a thing. But there are certain other things where. Maybe if you try and ask him on, on on different bits or what a player's like or you know tactical stuff, he's he's quite good on it. He's quite willing to talk about it, and I think he's quite uh, he's quite open with, on that side of stuff with the press. So uh, yeah, in answer to your question, he does have aura. He's he's I think he's a very intense guy. I think he's exactly. Very, That's another good word. Football, like, I think anyone who is as I think to be honest, to be a oh, Premier League, all football managers generally are like in the best way. They're all weirdos in the sense that like they're so focused and so intense, like. Exactly. Like their life is 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 this one sport, this one thing. It literally is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, I, I don't know about you, but I couldn't live like that personally. And no, I'm man. happy not I'm to. Exactly. I can see how if someone does live their life like that and you're trying to do the same thing as a footballer and you see your manager living their life like that, you're inspired to do the same thing yourself. And I think that's where a lot of it comes from with the Arsenal players, where they see Mikel, he just he lives his life by such high standards. I think you see the rest of them the rest of them sort of come in and see that they're like well, okay well this is the bar we have to we have to hit every single day and he doesn't let them slip beneath that so that's probably what Declan Rice is talking about there and I think yeah it, it makes a big difference see people I'm not making this up I'm not a weirdo <laughs> everyone else can see this as well and I hope everyone else is given an opportunity to see such man but okay it's been amazing man let people know where they can find you if they don't know about you which I can't imagine is a thing well it got it I'm sure there's plenty who don't I'm, I'm on Twitter at Kai at 97 I work for Football London. So, yeah, on the Football London website is where you can find all my articles. Also on Facebook, uh, Kaya Kainat Journalist. Uh, yeah, so give me a follow on there. And uh, I suppose what else am I doing? I'm trying to think of all the platforms. I do a bit of threads, not as much, but I'm trying to do a bit more threads, seeing as Twitter's becoming a bit of a hellscape these days. So, trying to do a bit more threads. So, I think I'm just Kaya Kainak on threads or maybe Kaya Kainak FL on threads. So, give me a follow there and I'll try and do a bit more there. So, yeah, great to hear from you all guys. And, and thanks for having me on again, mate. Minor man, you know you're always welcome. People, if you didn't catch that or you're too lazy to actually listen, all his information will be in the description. <laughs> it's been amazing having you here and picking your brains, man. Hopefully the next time we do this, we're still in high spirits, man. But yeah, I know it's been a busy day for you. Let me let you get out of here and enjoy what's left of it, my bro. Cheers, mate. Thank you.
Come on, man. Peace. People, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know your thoughts. I'm pretty sure you've agreed and disagreed with a lot of what both of us, both of us have had to say. So, yeah, man. On that note, peace, everybody. Say. <laughs>